Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York-based jazz pianist and conductor Mike Holliver. He was born in Brooklyn and raised in Long Island. And over our interview, he discussed his 2019 CD called Hiding Out. So after a decade spent hiding in plain sight as an arranger and composer with some of the world's most renowned large ensembles, he returns to the helm of his own stellar big band, the Gotham Jazz Orchestra. Trained as a classical pianist and conductor, he began his apprenticeship as a jazz pianist and composer after moving to New York City in 1986. He has released six recordings as a leader and could be heard on over 70 recordings as a sideman working with esteemed ensembles like the WDR and HR Big Bands and the Westchester Jazz Orchestra. So please get to know Mike and dig this interview, my friends. Thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So after a decade of hiding in plain sight as an arranger and a composer for, for large ensembles, you come back with your big band with the new release. 2019 hiding out talk to me about how refreshing it was to release this and kind of the artistic vision of this project part of it is very rewarding the um the hiding out has to do in, partially with where i wrote it which was um in this um artist colony in wyoming near the bighorn mountains called the u cross foundation i was in the cab and that was that was the hiding out where the title came from but also the last 10 years, all the work I've been doing with the radio bands in, in Cologne and in uh, Frankfurt and then directing Westchester Jazz Orchestra was mostly working as a conductor and an arranger. And it was really fantastic work and satisfying. But I, I felt like as a composer and as a leader, I, it wasn't satisfying in that way, so I felt like it was time to get my music back out there. And even before it's released, I can already feel like um, sort of like an identity boost. That I, I mean, I've always felt like a um, a composer who arranges, and I think that's part of the identity of my work as an arranger. So it's good to be back, really, as a composer and as as a leader. And, you know, working as a leader with my friends in New York is a lot of fun. I've I, I known them all forever, working with them as a sideman or working in places where I conduct and we're all sidemen. It's not my group, like um, with Westchester Jazz Orchestra, for example, or with BMI Jazz Composers Workshop and where I know all these people from so many different settings. And um, it's good to have them playing my my music again. Before we get into, you know, kind of getting into New York and your beginnings as as a musician and an arranger, talk to me a little bit about where you were born and raised and how you got into music. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I am from Brooklyn. I'm, I don't live in Brooklyn. I was, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm, was it before it was hip to be from Brooklyn? I don't know. Uh, and then I started classical piano lessons when I was very young, when I was six and a half, and, um, you know, took lessons and was a classical pianist through high school and then also got interested in jazz, started playing the saxophone. We moved out to Long Island. Then I went upstate for college and was actually a saxophone major when I got to college for about a week. And then I met this guy Charles Schneider who became my mentor and I went back to serious classical piano and I developed uh, what I like to think of as good skills as a reader and an accompanist and conducting also and I think that foundation in undergraduate school is what really resulted in this, the skills that's resulted in a lot of the work that I have now in the jazz world that you know a lot of it's been conducting and, you know, maybe leading people a little bit. I mean, with with Chuck, it was always amazing what a great leader was that he that he is and that everybody loves him through the whole thing. And to just be, um, you know, a leader and a conductor that people like to work with, I, I, I like to think that's me and that I got those skills and that experience um, there. And then I continued doing jazz stuff. I stopped playing the saxophone. I went to grad school, continued to study classical piano, but then as soon as I finished my master's, it was kind of a full, full-on full switch to jazz, and I was already writing. And um, 
And that was great. Those were years in Binghamton, Oneonta, and then Binghamton. And then in 1986, I moved to New York and started freelancing and then very quickly started teaching at NYU and then at City College. And then I became full-time at City College. And it's been 25 years now as a professor at City College in the Jazz Studies program. And then the last four years, I've been teaching at the Manhattan School also, Manhattan School of Music, one class in jazz composition and arranging. So in the beginning, what jazz musicians or albums or music were you listening to that really got you going? Oh, I, I, in high school, I remember there were two records that our teacher had, and there were about four or five of us that were getting nuts about jazz. One of them was a Benny Goodman quartet record that was baseless, which I which was fascinating, you know, with Teddy Wilson and uh, Gene Krupa. And... Um, then there was also um, Miles Davis' Round Midnight was in the office, and that was a completely much deeper religious experience for me. And we used to just hang out after school and listen to those records. We weren't quite sessioning yet. We weren't at that level, but uh, we did have jazz bands. And then I remember when I got, I remember very well the first record I ever bought in, in high school um, I think it was WRVR was a big station in New York, and Sonny Stitt was in his heyday playing and recording all the time. And I, it was mostly Stitt and some Freddie Hubbard were the things that completely drove me nuts. I wanted to have that language that Stitt has. I, I was still playing a little saxophone then. And um, the first record I ever got was a Stitt record with Paul Gonzalez called Salt and Pepper. And I still listen to it with Tommy Flanagan and um, Bill Hinton. And I... Uh, just the language, like Stitt's perfect bebop language and Gonzalez's funky weirdness that I'm still completely fascinated by. You know, in the growth of of a musician over time, the the legends and luminaries that you can get around will teach you quite a bit. You've been around a lot like Dr. Lonnie Smith, Al Foster, John Schofield, Randy Brecker. Talk to me a little bit about what these people did to help you grow. Well, I, that's a more recent thing with all of, you know, in the last uh, 10 years, that some of those people were um, were guests that played with Westchester Jazz Orchestra, so I would write for them. And then some people that I did uh, ended up working with as a sideman, like I had a little, one record with Randy Brecker, not his record, um, uh, but someone, you know, got so I've known Randy for a long time, and uh, same thing with, like, Jan, John Abercrombie. May he rest in peace. He was a beautiful person and musician. Um, that I I have known luminaries in that way, but it's in the, in the last six or seven years with the German radio orchestras when I started getting hired to arrange full concerts and conduct for, like, Dr. Lonnie and Al Foster. And being, you know, spending that much time, the rehearsal period, talking about the music, um, and then going through the concerts with, um, I guess, masters. Incredibly special to be around people like that. And, and it, it reminds you of, um, you know, that you're standing on other people's shoulders who just, I mean, Dr. Lonnie Smith, both of those guys, their depth of feel and time, it keeps you modest. It, it reminds you that um, no matter how much you work on something, you're always aspiring to be better. And then some of the other people I've worked with in those contexts, writing whole concerts for and conducting like Miguel Zanon and Kurt Rosenwinkel, they are incredible musicians. And also I'm very fortunate to have written um, arrangements of their music because I feel like it's very well suited to my tastes in that it's modern and that it's open and there's room for me to put my own voice in there with them feeling that I've complimented their music. And I like to think that when I do a uh, jazz orchestra arrangement of a small group piece, that I'm reinterpreting it for jazz orchestra, that I'm not just putting a little orchestration on it, but saying, if this had originally been a jazz orchestra composition, here's how it would go in my, you know, in my imagination. And then in reality, and then you, yeah. and then you hope that they, they like it instead of, which is, um, you know, usually the case, like, that's so great what you did with my music. So let me ask you this. What was one of the first jazz shows you ever witnessed that really moved you? Well, when I was in college upstate, my 
uh, girlfriend at the time, now wife. We've been together for over 40 years. Um, we used to come to New York and hear jazz pretty regularly. We go down to the city. And regardless of what we heard, we would very often go to Bradley's afterwards. And I heard Tommy Flanagan probably four or five times when I was a sophomore, junior, and senior in college. And that really struck me as beautiful musicianship and piano playing, uh, which as a pianist, I feel like I'm very sensitive to um, articulation and sound and comping of the piano player. And um, because it's a percussion instrument, and it's, sometimes it can be hard to really phrase beautifully like a wind instrument can. And um, so I think about that in my own playing, and hearing Tommy Flanagan a lot was really... Um, inspiring and um, hopefully influential as a, you know, as a pianist myself. And then also that's the first time I heard Fred Hirsch, who is a good friend now and uh, one of my favorite musicians, and um, hearing Kenny Barron. And so part of it was a pianism, a pianism thing. I also heard Tom Harrell in those times, who later had the opportunity to play with quite a bit. That was in the early 90s. That was quite a while ago. Um, and so just, I think that sort of shaped a uh, part of my taste for an appreciation for an established language and also an appreciation, like in Tom's case, for really forward-looking, composing, and um, and improvising. Right on. So why do you love jazz? <laughs> wow, as it should be. Do you love jazz? Uh, why do you love jazz? <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes you love something, so when it's not right, it can really drive you insane. <laughs> wow. That's a that, is that a tough question? I don't know. Uh, it can be. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, there are so many ways to be satisfied by it. I mean, I really as a, a as someone with a classical background, I can't believe how well composers heard it, and how beautiful the interpretations can be from a pianist or from an orchestra. But from a jazz perspective, being able to actually have that power to improvise, to make up your own melody at that moment is kind of, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, I think it really gives you a chance for expression that is something different than when you're just interpreting a composer's notes. And then also as a composer and an arranger, getting to form things that are completely new yourself but, and the sound of jazz harmony to me, the mixture of like um, something modal, something that comes from French Impressionist music, something that comes from folk music, something that has swing, something that has the blues, getting to use all those different expressive devices is, it's, it's really satisfying and it's, it's powerful. You know, I think as an arranger, we have a lot of power because you there's so many tools with orchestration and rhythm and who solos and what you decide for reharmonization. You can work with very little and create a lot. So this is my final question. Everyone has a version or an interpretation of you, your family, your friends, your colleagues, but you know who you are best. Who do you think you are? Wow. That's... <laughs> Oh, wow. That's tough, too, because it immediately makes me think about in relation to things other than music. And you that know, works. Like, you know, like with my friends and my wife and how much time I spend outside. I'm, if the second thing in my life, well, maybe the third thing in my life after my friends and my family is after music would be that I'm into hiking and climbing, and I've been doing it since I was a teenager. And I, I'm, you know, Monday we're leaving for a trip, and it's the inspiration for a lot of my music. But if I don't get outside, then I feel like there's something dead about my soul, and that goes, you know, that goes right. It does go right to the music. The, the pieces on on the new record on Hiding Out are mostly, well, I like to think that they were written in a perfect storm of compositional opportunity and that I had a great commissions, Philadelphia Museum, 
West Jesuit Jazz Orchestra with a, a New York State Council of the Arts grant. But I also had residencies in amazing places to write the music so that it was sort of, uh, I mentioned the Ucross Foundation where I wrote Hiding Out and then um, Flow, the other main work on the CD is um, was written at the McDowell Colony, which is in New Hampshire, and I was in the same cabin where Copeland worked on Appalachian Spring and Bernstein worked on his mass, and it's it's been there since 1907. It's it's a fantastic um, place to to work. Um, so maybe that's kind of t- taking a little bit of a turn from who I am. But the you had asked me at first about the artistic concept of the record, and the, it's a double CD, as you know. And the two main pieces are these multi movement movement suites, where I'm just thinking. Um, long form train of thought tone poems like um well, tone poems like maybe Debussy's Je or his nocturnes orchestral nocturnes or Onager um uh, they, they were called movement symphoniques like if you know Pacific 231 which is a piece about a, a train locomotive well, he didn't think so but later was interpreted that way that's kind of the artistic concept of the record, but it's definitely influenced by some of that Americana vibe of Copeland, which I think in part is that, to me, it's like the mountains, the west, the lake, where I've spent a total of years. So, and fortunately, my wife likes to do the same thing. So that's right on. <laughs> that's right on. Good. That's awesome. I like that answer. It's a great answer. It's a great way to wrap everything up. Mike, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I really appreciate it and continued success with the album and your career. Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Mike for his stories and his music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.